Hey everybody. Alright, so it's a, it's a busy day. We're trying to get some videos in here before I run out of time at the library. This is the library. Um, so I'm just going to talk real quick about who I am. People often ask why, what, what makes me credible and blah blah blah. You know what? This is who I am. My name is Curtis. Alright. I was raised a Jehovah's Witness. I am, at the time of this video, I am 35 years old. I am a husband. I have one biological child and five stepchildren, three of which live with me right now, but hopefully we'll, we'll get everything squared away and we'll have all of our, our children back under one roof the way it's supposed to be. Um, my bad decision making about a year ago has put my family out of out of housing and uh, we're, we're technically homeless right now. It's a true story. Um, my wife and I sleep in our van at the moment. We've got our kids staying with my mom but there just isn't enough space around there for everybody. So also a true story. Um, I love discussing theology almost as much as, as, you know what, I won't say almost as much. Let me just change that whole sentence. I, I love to discuss theology. I do. I love talking about beliefs and concepts. One of my, my great passions. So is science. I love science. I love the concepts and the practice and I love science. I like it best when I can find the ways that the two actually line up because to me that suggests the highest probability is not that science and theology are two different things anybody that says otherwise they just don't understand okay we know this because cells work put yourself in God's shoes for a second do you want creatures that need you to come down and, and deal with them every time you blink an eye or do you want self-sufficient beings that are capable of doing the tasks assigned them. You incorporate something like a self-repair kit <laughs> so that if they get hurt on the job they don't need you to come down and fix them every time they turn around. Right? That makes sense. What doesn't make sense is evolving from a handful of random cells. That does not make sense to me. Um, it just, it just doesn't make sense to me. Um, I like toys a lot. I've loved toys since I was little. I think everything about the concept of play is amazing. It's a developmental tool. It is, it is recreation. It is therapy. Everything about toys is an amazing thing. It, it makes me happy to, to work with toys. I do custom action figures. I take an existing toy apart for pieces and I re-sculpt new details and I make something different out of the old toy. Sometimes I take multiple toys and combine them all together and sometimes I take a toy and completely replace a part with something that I sculpted entirely on my own. I have a history of painting Warhammer 40k miniatures and confrontation and other miniature war game stuff. That's what got me started on the whole, well, professionally doing it. I used to customize my toys back as a kid, back when I had no idea what I was doing with paint. I would buy the little small, uh, like, testers and model master paints, and I would repaint the G.I. Joe in a new color, and the paint would never dry. <laughs> and it would ruin my G.I. Joes all the time. <laughs> I would, uh, I tried painting my little plastic cowboy and Indian toys, you know, the ones, multicolored bag of like 20 and 50 from the grocery store. Oh my god, those used to be so awesome. So much imagination went into playing with them. And then, uh, and then there's of course the family life, you know. I grew up in a mostly a single parent home. My dad was not much of a dad. My mom was a, a hard worker, but she was in over her head by herself. There was no way she could do it all by herself. Um, she used to be a housekeeper for, for families. 
she would go clean their houses to make sure that we had the clothes and, and the money and stuff like that. Um, somehow, I mean, even with all of that, somehow she still managed to make sure that we had nice toys to play with from time to time. Very rarely were our toys ever hand-me-down toys. Our clothes were frequently hand-me-downs, but I could have cared less. That never even bothered me. I would have been just as comfortable wearing rags to school if that's what it had come to. I didn't care. But, uh, but having a Voltron toy was awesome. And my mom, and out of all the disagreements and differences of opinion that she and I have on so many things, I get that that was something that she understood with me, was what was important to me. And she went out of her way to try to make sure that those things, the, the most important ones, were taken care of. I wasn't that kid where I felt I had to have every single toy that came out, but I had, I had very specific wants, and if I didn't have those wants met, it was very disappointing to me, because it would ground me back to the reality of how bad our situation was. But as long as I didn't have to focus on that, it, it made it a lot easier for me. And I was always a bright student. I was one of the first talkers in my, the, my whole family history. Okay, as far back as anybody can remember, I was talking long before I was a year old. <laughs> I caught on to sounds and words, and by the time I was two, I could talk circles around most college kids, and by the time I was four, my kindergarten teacher sat there talking to my mom and talking about me like, like I wasn't actually part of the conversation. And so she finally said something where she used my name and I went over and I spoke to her as if I was one of the other parents in the room. And I will never forget Miss Melton's face as her jaw slowly drops. Something like this. Amazed at the vocabulary I had at four years old. It's always how my family has been though. Lots of my family is really bright. It's not just me. I always had good grades in school. I was testing on 12th grade levels by the time I was in 4th grade, college levels after that. I failed 5th grade because I was determined I was going to make them skip me since I was testing so high. And they were determined they were going to prove me wrong. That was never going to happen. And they won. They won that round. I failed 5th grade because I wouldn't do any work. And, uh, and that grounded me again, put me back in reality. And that, that was when I realized that maybe I wasn't as smart as I thought I was. That was the first time I had that realization. So my response to it wasn't, well, then I hate everything. No. My response was, I need to be smarter. I need to know more. So I spent that summer reading dictionaries and encyclopedias and reference materials and everything I could get my hands on, all while reading three to ten books a week, depending on the size of the book from the library that whole summer. My second time around in fifth grade, my teachers didn't know what to do with me. They stopped being able to grade most of my papers because they didn't know what I was talking about anymore. Those were good times. Eventually I got to realizing that I don't like the way school systems work. It's not fair to grade kids on the same perspective. That's ridiculous. You can't tell me that it's fair to put a 1 to 100, 0 to 100 grade rating on a paper and then compare my work with another student. My learning curve is different from somebody else's. So if, if we have a, learn, a learning session, a class, that fits my particular type of learning better than the next students, I have an insanely unfair advantage, and vice versa. You can't say that's fair. Given a little more time, that other student might have gotten the exact same information and understood it perfectly. Given too much time, I'll lose interest and maybe I would have failed it. The school system's just not really the, the right way yet. It's a good idea, but it's not, not fair. And it's not going to reflect fairness for some time to come. Um, you can't see her, but that's my beautiful wife peeking in the room from outside right now, checking to see what I'm doing back here, watching like she usually does, just to see me on my videos. And I'm going to wave to her real quick. Um, this is who I am. 
Okay? I don't think that I have all the answers. I don't think I even know all the questions. <laughs> How could I possibly have all the answers without all the questions first? I think it's a shame that so many people are afraid to say they don't know. It's an even bigger crime that so many people don't know and then have the nerve to act like they know exclusively and then try to push what they think on somebody else. It's atrocious. I love science fiction. Star Wars is my first movie that I remember as a kid and while I can pull that memory right up just like that, I remember very specifically sleeping through so much of that movie. <laughs> I remember C-3PO and R2-D2 walking through the desert. I remember Obi-Wan and Darth Vader fighting with lightsabers. I remember the, the Death Star exploding. I remember stormtroopers running. It's really all I remember from Star Wars. But it made such an impression on my little child mind that it, it hooked me. It hooked me for life. I'm one of the, the, the serious Star Wars fans. I'm not one of the, the little poser Star Wars fans that get out there and, and think they have to hate everything about Star Wars because that's the only way to be cool about liking Star Wars is you have to hate it. So not true. That's not me. I love the concept of the, the futuristic fairy tale. It, I mean, it's right there. You've got your young farm boy that wants to grow up to be a knight. You've got the crazy old wizard that's not really so crazy after all whose job is to help that young farm boy become a knight. You've got the impregnable capsule that, uh, that's in this faraway place that where the evil black knight has captured the princess. You've got a couple of little rogue scoundrels who are kind of bad guys but have hearts of gold. I mean, Star Wars is a perfect fairy tale, right? Empire Strikes Back is not actually my personal favorite movie only because they left out one of my favorite scenes from the books. Um, I like Empire a lot but honestly Return of the Jedi was was my favorite. I really enjoyed Return of the Jedi the most. Empire was really good but Return of the Jedi. Luke is my favorite character out of the Star Wars saga. Um, I liked the prequels just fine. I had no problem with Jar Jar Binks I thought Jar Jar was annoying, but he was supposed to be annoying. He did his job perfect. I think Anakin was a little a little whiny, but again, they needed to try to convey who Anakin was. And while a better child actor might have done a better job, the little boy was okay. His acting chops weren't up to the role, admittedly. But the movie was good regardless. Ray Park is Darth Maul. Much love. That brother is hardcore, and without him, the fight scenes may not have been nearly so cool. And they were cool. I love, I love Star Wars. I like Star Trek. A lot of people think they have to choose between the two. I disagree. I like the fantasy aspects of Star Wars, and I love the sci-fi aspects of Star Trek. Do I like Star Wars a little better? I do. I don't generally care for stuff with magic and mysticism in it, though. Uh, Harry Potter does nothing for me. I don't like sword and sorcery movies most of the time. In Shrek, I'm a lot more like Lord Farquaad than I am <laughs> anything else, even though I may look like Shrek. Okay? Um, I hate fairies, elves, dragons, gremlins, goblins, whatever. It's just not my cup of tea. I am a person. I am a person with faith in, in beings that I don't see. I believe that the reality around me was created by a creator God. I believe this not because the Bible says anything about it, but because I look around and I see the complexity of my world. And I refuse to risk denying a being that could have done all that. The, the respect they deserve for that work, for that artwork that I see everywhere I look. I don't care if the Bible has been manipulated. The Bible isn't why I have faith. The Bible really has very little to do with my faith. 
I don't believe in organized religion. I think people's religious beliefs and faith gets corrupted when dealing with religion. Religion is a direct line to too many people that want to push their own personal agendas. And that makes me very nervous. Too many opportunities for somebody to teach a lot of people the really wrong thing. I can't back that anymore. This does not mean I don't believe in God. This means that I don't believe in trying to worship a God the way somebody else tells me I have to do it. That's all that means. I don't hate Catholics. I don't hate Jehovah's Witnesses. I don't hate Jews. I don't hate Israelis or anybody else out there. I don't hate anybody because of their race, color, creed. I don't care what your sexual orientation is. Okay? The Bible says that homosexuality is a sin, and I honestly... I, I'm not homosexual. It's not my thing. My answer to that, though, is that I just don't do it. Do what you want to do. If it's a sin, well, you know what? That's between you and God. If it's not a sin to him, then it doesn't really matter. Either way, it was never up to me. And because it's not up to me, it's none of my business. Okay? I like lasagna, but I'm allergic to onions. I think a nice Sara Lee cherry cheesecake may be the best kind of dessert in the entire universe. Um, I love Cold Stone ice cream. I am the originator of what in San Rafael, California used to be called the Curtis Special. I don't know if there's enough Cold Stone around for anybody to still ask for it as that. But it was a cheesecake ice cream with cherry pie, apple pie, Cherry pie filling, apple pie filling, and graham cracker crust. Easily one of the most delicious things you could ever imagine in terms of an ice cream. Um, I used to be one of those guys with a chip on my shoulder about a lot of the way life had played out around me. One of the things that helped me change that was one of the guys I had a conversation with at Coldstone. Joan used to come in and we would talk business every now and then. And just some of the, the, the little gems of wisdom he would share with me changed everything. Changed my whole perspective on the world. I used to think that collecting comic books and stuff was going to one day be my, my fortune in the sky. And he was like, you know what? That's awesome. You collect comic books? That's cool. How much is your collection worth? And I said, you know what? At the time, my collection between my toys and comics was pushing a value, a price guide value of something like twenty thousand dollars. He's like, Wow, is that a is that a month? Is that a year? And I was like, Well no, I mean like if I sold all of it and he's like So it doesn't bring in anything right now, huh? And I was like, Well no, he's like, How much do you think you spend a month on it? And I was like, Between two hundred and four hundred dollars a month, I guess he's like, Huh. And you've been doing this for how long? And I'm like, for years, I don't really even know. And he's like so by the time you sold it, I mean, even if you sold it for twenty thousand dollars, have you been doing this for more than ten years? And I'm like, yeah, easily. And he's like, so you're pretty much losing money then, right? And I was like, well, no, I don't guess so, because I mean, I've sold some of it here and there. And he's like, okay, where do you keep it at? And I was like, well, at home. And he's like. Well, how much is your rent? <laughs> and we play this back and forth game, and so ultimately the whole point is that <laughs> he convinces me that my collection's not really worth anything, even though it price guides for a value. The, the value is not taking into account all of the other expenses involved with it. And that changed my entire perspective on it. Because, I mean, it wasn't like I was thinking, you know, I'm going to... I'm going to collect so that I can get rich. But it was that I was already enjoying it. And then one day, when the time came, boom, I, w I would have it set. One of my other clients later on, for painting the little miniature figures, the little 30, what was it, 35 millimeter or whatever, miniatures, asked me if I knew anything about customizing action figures. And I laughed and explained that I used to customize my G.I. Joes. My brother and I had made our own jokes of ourselves so that we could send ourselves on little missions with, with our favorite figures and stuff. And they were like, dude, you got to check it out. They showed me a wizard magazine and, uh, or a toy fair or something where 
they had uh, custom action figures and showed how much money people were making on eBay for that. And I charged people a very respectable $15 per model to paint, okay? That's not including assembly. I didn't like assembling figures. But I was easily, and still am, one of the fastest painters in the world. I can paint a complete model, little bring it to the 35 millimeter figure from primed, which means, you know, ready for painting, in less than 10 minutes. And set on the table, you couldn't tell the difference between that and a figure somebody had painted for three days. This was really cool to me because I had been working on this and I had gotten very good at it. And I was painting an average of six figures an hour. If it was something army, like a really generic type of trooper, I could easily hit ten of those an hour. Fifteen dollars an hour made decent money for a stretch there. Uh, that's all I was doing. I wasn't working a regular job. But the, the whole point is that even in making that kind of money, realizing that there was a possibility for me to put those toys I had collected to use to make money was awesome to me. So uh, I made some customs and for a little bit there, you know, they, they weren't great or anything, but they were okay. I was doing all right. I, uh, I was getting an average of like 30 to, to $40 per custom. And then I learned some new tricks, and then the prices on my customs started reflecting that, and I was easily hitting $50 a custom. And this was amazing to me that that my artwork, my my life background in art, was finally letting me do something. I had tried to get into comic books for years and couldn't do it. Lots of rejection letters from Marvel. <laughs> it was it was ridiculous, but it was it was just what happens, you know. It used to make me so bitter because Rob Liefeld got work, and uh, at the time, I felt I could draw circles around him. His proportions were bad and all this kind of stuff. Well, anyway, the point is, it, it, it added to that bitterness. And here I was, almost 10 years later, 12 years later in my life, and I was getting the chance to do art using toys and comic book characters all at one time. It was perfect for me. I kept working at it and kept working at it and kept working at it. And I got up to the point where I was legitimately bringing in a lot of money doing customs. And I had a lot of very satisfied clients. Last year, 2010, um, my brother and I tried to open a, a gaming and hobby store and had some issues. I still owed seven hundred dollars on back child support, but in trying to open a a game store, this now gave me trackable income for the government purposes and stuff. And while I had worked to pay off a lot of back debts and everything and getting everything caught up and squared away, this was a process. So Division of Child Support made a huge error. I made a seven hundred dollar payment and they applied it as a seven thousand dollar charge against me. And this ultimately would lead to my brother and I having to close our store before we ever got to have our grand opening. True story. By the time they acknowledged that they had made the mistake and then refunded the money that they had seized, it was far too late for us to save our store. This, of course, put me back to being unemployed again and no income for the moment as far as trackable and now I had all this debt for the store that we had to take care of. So I continued to make customs for a stretch there. Dealing with the courts and the government, oh, gotta, gotta love them, gotta hate them. Um, I wound up having to take a real job again and right when, I mean literally, it must have been days, days tops, like three three days. Um, I go to court. Judge is like, you gotta do something. You gotta get a real job. I say, okay. Go home, talk to my wife. This is one of those times where I'll go ahead and say it. I prayed about it. I was like, man, I have no idea how I'm gonna get out of this. What am what I gonna do? You know? Customizing was was working 
and almost got all the bills and everything taken care of from the past. Roommates were kind of taking care of some of their parts of the bills and stuff at the time. You know, it, it was starting to recover again. The damage that had been done was getting undone, and things were going good. And uh, my old boss, assistant manager where I used to work at, gives me a call and she's like, oh my God, look right, got a job opportunity for you. You're out in Virginia, but I mean, it's out in California. If you guys want to come out here, there's a there's a place that, that's looking for a general manager. So the opportunity to get back into working at a hotel and this time as the GM, that sounded great to me. So I go out for the interview, and uh, I won't talk about him as much, but I'll say the situation and the and the. The, the whole situation was just misportrayed to me. It was portrayed very different from what the reality was. But in my head, in my, the paper, the way this looked said that we would stand to make an extra thousand dollars a month more than what we were bringing in already. And it would be trackable. And by paper, we'd only be working 40 to 45 hours a week. 40 to 48 hours a week, sorry, 40 to 48, 45, 48, something along those lines. And uh, this would allow me the time to keep customizing. So I said, let's do it. And my wife, bless her heart, said, if that's what I want to do, let's do it. But we got out there and everything was nothing like what we were told it would be. Um, the situation was really bad. And where I was only supposed to be working about 8 to really just about eight hours a day. That was the whole point of it being a couple, is we each work eight hours, overlap a little bit, and that way the, our nighttime people can come in and back clean up, you know, leaves us time for the, the kids at night, we're fine. And in that, I would still have time to customize. Everything was, was going to be perfect, but it didn't work out that way. What wound up happening was we would work something along the lines of uh, 14 hours a day, frequently. Um, on some of the worst days, I would pull a, the equivalent of a day and a half shift. I would start at 7 in the morning and I wouldn't get off until 3.30, 5 o'clock the next day, in, in the afternoon the next day. Um, eating became pizza every day, uh, pretty much literally. <laughs> We ate pizza at least six nights a week over there, and we almost never ate breakfast because how do you eat breakfast when the owner is calling you every time there's anything that he sees on the cameras that he's a little worried about? Um, we had employees that were stealing from the drawer. We had housekeepers who wouldn't work. We had a night auditor who didn't understand what a night auditing meant. And all of this all together was being put on me because as the manager I was being expected to train them but the trick was this the staff came with the job I didn't hire any of them and in trying to train them none of them were interested because they had already seen so many other managers come and go all of them treated it as you're just another manager that's only here for a little while we're the ones that are still going to be here when you're gone we're not going to learn something new why do that to ourselves? This helped build a, a lot of tension that caused us to have to work, us, my wife and I, to have to work a lot harder than we ever should have had to. This started in September of last year, and this caused me to start getting behind on my orders for my customers. This getting behind rolled over for months, and I was just getting, getting further behind. Five months later, six months later, we're trying to get out of the situation. And the last two weeks we were there, I literally worked 130 hours and then 136 hours back-to-back -back weeks. Okay? I was literally working three different days over shifts. 11 o'clock p.m. on Sunday night to cover night audit. And I'd work the full 24 hours from then and then pull the night audit the next day and then do my regular manager shift the next day and then get off at three, try to sleep for a little bit 
have to get up to take care of feeding the family and stuff, try to sleep for a little bit, and then start again at 11. All the while getting phone calls constantly that need my immediate attention because the owner wouldn't allow the employees to simply do their jobs. We had to leave. That is how we wound up homeless. We moved cross country back to Virginia. This wiped out every dime we had to our names to get ourselves out of the situation. Where the original plan would have had us buying our own home at the end of this year, by September this year, that was the way this all would have worked out. Now instead, we're sleeping in a van. So, so this is who I am. This is the person that I am. This is what I deal with in my life. I didn't talk anything really about my ex-wife and the fighting and stuff for my son. I left out lots of different things. I figured this is all the, that's really important to, to really talk about at the moment. This is who I am. When you ask, well, and you challenge what I believe and all that kind of stuff. What makes me credible, blah, blah, blah. Okay, your turn. Prove who you are.